Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Neil Sahota, who is up in UC Irvine. How are you doing, Neil? Hey, I'm doing all right, John. How about yourself? Oh, very, very good. And Neil is an IBM master inventor, United Nations artificial intelligence subject matter expert and a professor at UC Irvine. And Neil, today we're going to talk about AI. I mean, there's been a lot of hype around AI for a lot of different things, but you're interested, particularly in a, in a post-COVID, or hopefully we're in a post-COVID world someday soon, mm. about how AI can be leveraged for, for social good. I, I, I am. Um, you think about it, there's a lot of applications, a lot of things we could possibly do. There's a lot of smart people out there, but you know, you get a bunch of really great technologists in the room and they think about things like, you know, self-driving cars and space mm -hmm. elevators, which, nothing wrong with that. But you think about all the challenges we got, COVID, the pandemic, access to good education, you know, poverty, hunger, imagine we could channel some of our energy into these areas. Yeah, it, it always seems, guy. I mean, as we said, it's great, all these things and like, people trying to go to Mars and all of that. And it all sounds great. But I always then think about, okay, but there are some people in the world today who still don't have access to clean water, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and as you say, I mean, with all this innovation and technology and brain power, there, there's, there's some real world problems that we could probably solve if we put our energy in the right direction. Well, we talk a lot about moonshots, right, John? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes we need some earth shots too. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things is you think about like marketing and sales. There's a host of AI tools out there for uh, psychographics, neurolinguistics, and connecting better with your customer, B2B or B2C. But we've also learned that we can repurpose some of this stuff. The biggest illness in the world is actually loneliness. Mm -hmm. And if we could give people an outlet, understand them better and how to communicate, we could actually engage, not using the AI to replace human interaction, but help those people build enough confidence so they can actually form human relationships. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fascinating point. And we've seen that obviously accentuated uh, because of the pandemic and the, uh, I wouldn't say the rise so much of, of, of as you say, loneliness and mental illness and things like this, but I think they're becoming more to the fore because they're, they're becoming more apparent during the pandemic. And yeah, there's probably great applications for AI, but as you say, we tend to always think of it in terms of like marketing and, and, and customer outreach and all of that. What are, what are some of the most innovative ways you have seen AI used for something that may be a little bit more out of the ordinary? Well, you know, we, we hear a lot about things like Neuralink from like Elon Musk and some of these things. And can we use AI to kind of decode our brains? But we actually have technology now that we're using where if you think about it, if someone loses a limb, the brain can still transmit signals to the stump, right? Mm -hmm. And rather than trying to decode the brain, it's really a series of processes going on. And so, you know, some really smart doctors and biologists have learned that Rather than trying to decode the brain, we can decode muscle and tendon movement, right? Using so the AI can figure that out and then can help control a robot hand, robot foot. And now we're actually able to restore mobility to people that have lost a limb or were born without a limb. Yeah, which I mean, and that that's just uh, I mean that's mind blowing to be able to do things like that. And and I think something else that you just touched on there for a moment is on the education front, right? Because as we know the important uh, we know the importance of education but we also know that there's an education gap as well and access to to good education and there's a whole i can get into the political debate around around access to good education but the fact is i think if there's one thing the pandemic has taught us is that traditional education was is ill prepared to leverage technology properly to 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 for the, all the advantages it could give to actually uh, increasing access to education for everybody. It's been a big challenge. I mean, we actually still use 19th century techniques to teach, to educate. Mm -hmm. And you think about how kids really learn today, it, there's a huge divide right there. But 
I find it interesting because as everyone's trying to struggle and figure out how to do Zoom classes, you have a whole group of people now talking about, you need to figure out how to do virtual reality classes. Right. And it, and not, we're not talking 10 years, they're talking about, we should have been doing the online stuff 10 years ago, we realize that now, let's jump ahead and figure out the next piece. But you alluded to something actually very important, John, which is not everybody has access to the same infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that there's some families out there, some children struggling because they don't have high speed internet or they don't even have a, a laptop or a Chromebook or anything like that. If you don't have that infrastructure, then what happens to these people that we can't leave them behind? Yeah. I mean, we're also, uh, in some ways, I mean, we're reaching a point where access to broadband or 5G or whatever it is, it, um, it almost becomes something that, it, you know, everybody should have access to like they do, you know, running water or whatever in, you know, particularly in, in places like this, because yeah, otherwise you're not, otherwise you're going to continue to have a, a digital divide of, of some degree. And we've seen that, I mean, we've seen in, uh, in, in neighborhoods and, and school districts where they have shut, you know, shut down and they're not going back to school, but there's one computer in a home and there's three, four children. Okay. That's the, that's, you hit it around the nose, John. That's the best way to put it, right? We, mm -hmm. not just that we were unprepared. I think people are surprised that we were lacking some of these quote unquote basic necessities. You, you brought up a really good point earlier about people not having access to like clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. Most people, I think at least in the US don't realize that half the world doesn't have access yeah. to that, right? And there's some of the people like that in the States. And so if you don't have access to water, how are you gonna have access to high speed internet? or yeah. a computer, you know, I mean, there, there are families struggling where they're giving their kid their flip phone, hoping they can do their schoolwork on it. Yeah. And, and as I said, I mean, it's obviously in, you know, different issues in different places, but they, they, the clean running water is the thing that I find is most amazing is, is that there are still places in the world that don't have access. And that should be something that could be solved relatively easily. You would think using modern technology, if there was a, a will, a will to do that, and I think sometimes we forget here, and particularly in the estates in the states where, and I'm originally from Ireland, so I have also an outside perspective. Like sometimes, it, when I hear people in the states kind of complaining about their lives or complaining about you know the states, you go, yeah, it's not perfect, but boy, you need to live somewhere else for for a while before you realize how first world your problems are. <laughs> That, that that's very true right um it's funny how problems are so localized and you mm -hmm. take a lot of things for granted without realizing it mm -hmm. but it's it's i think on the flip side is we also don't teach ourselves to think about some of these things right mm -hmm. we're, we're thinking about how we can monetize we think about business roi all those kinds of things we never also think about you know i could i could make money but i could try and do good at the same time right is there yeah. a, a synergistic path here around yeah, social yeah. enterprise social entrepreneurship yeah, and they're not, I mean, they're not mutually exclusive, um, absolutely. So um, so what are some of the ways that you think that AI could, uh, I mean, we alluded to some about VR for education. What are other things that AI could help in in education and help in, and, and I would say particularly in access to, to good education? Because again, um, you know, we've, we've been reliant on physical places. We've been relying on these big campuses and colleges and all of that and all the additional burden that comes with that but there's got to be ways of making that accessible in just as rich a fashion you know to people who maybe don't want to or can't invest in that that much well there's there's a big push into like the ai tutor mm -hmm. we know that all these kids learn differently some are auditory some are visual they learn different speeds different strengths that yeah we can actually tap into ai to kind of individualize the curriculum so actually give a tool, a platform for parents and kids and uh, school administrators to learn the how each child learns and the speed at which they learn. So rather than everyone's in a classroom, virtual or not, and you teach the lowest common denominator, you're actually empowering the teachers to teach at every student's kind of speed so they kind of maximize the resonance. There's actually a company in Orange County called Renovations that's actually doing that right now. Wow. And start, uh, I think some pilots with some local schools to you know create individualized curriculum yeah and i think that's i think that's a fantastic um, innovation because as you say 
Um, there's some people who excel in the classroom setting. There are some people who are, who are you know, great note takers, some people who are great test and assessment takers. Um, but everybody's not the same. And, and some people, as you say, learn very differently. And I think to your point, I mean, maybe when I was growing up, yeah, these differences existed, but I just, I doubt they were as, uh, as, as pronounced maybe as they are now because um, the kids growing up are used to consuming information in so many different ways than we were. I, I call it kind of soundbite age. You know, when I teach online classes, <laughs> I don't do like, okay, my traditional, you know, hour long lecture type of thing. Yeah. I have to chunk up the topics into like four or five minute segments, you know, it's a little, little burst, little burst, you know? Yeah. yeah. I know I was having my, my son, my 15 year old son was doing something today and they had to pick an article um, on something and, you know, we was looking at it in some of the articles and he went, Oh, that, that article is so long. It was about it was about seven paragraphs, which isn't long for you from traditionally for an article, not that long. But he was like, "Whoa, that's a long article." <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised. I don't know if you've noticed now on some of the online magazines and newspapers, they tell you how long it will take to read the article. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think that's where we, that's where we've gotten to. Um, so what are some other what are some other ways that you have seen um, AI start to be applied, like you were saying with that uh, innovation and that pilot in Orange County? Well, I mean, other than like education, agriculture has been a very big mm -hmm. focal area, right? There's a lot of concern. We know we have the resources to actually feed everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. The question is, how come we can't do it more effectively? And so people are actually using AI and like IoT and even drone technology together. Mm -hmm help third world farmers. So you've seen like farmers now in like Bangladesh or in like parts of Africa where they don't have the best topsoil, but the AI is looking at like predicting like climate and insect infestation, all these other things mm -hmm. and saying like, you know, if you were to plant this seed two millimeters over, you could grow 30% more crops with half as much water and, you know, a third of topsoil consumption. And so that sounds great, and it is. You know, we're freeing more people, but mm -hmm. we've also seen that by being able to do that, it's generating more money in the local economy. So it's helping to create yeah. jobs, create a little more tax base, which is now fueling more hospitals and schools. And so they're kind of seeing the amplified effect of doing that. Yeah, no, and absolutely. And I think anything that can provide the opportunity for people to be able to live and succeed where they are as opposed to always having to emigrate or, or or migrate i mean i think the i think the at the end of the day i think it's it'd be great for people to have the choice say yeah if i want to move to somewhere else for great but i also have the opportunity to stay here as you say and actually develop my own community and my own economy uh, that, that's what it is right they call it good money right i think good money is mm -hmm. when you generate a dollar and it stays inside your community to help your community yeah. We've seen more of those opportunities. And I think if there's one thing that uh, all of the turmoil that we see today maybe maybe is teaching us is that is 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 the re-emphasizing the importance of community and of how you can impact your own community. Because I mean, I just think people, sometimes people spend a lot of time on big macro issues that they really have very little impact on. And it maybe sounds great. And you can sit out your backyard and have a few beers and talk about these huge, massive global issues. And it's an interesting conversation, but your impact on it is absolutely zero. But when you do something in your local community, there is a, a real impact and a real multiplier, as you said, good money multiplier. Well, that's what we need. We need to move the needle, right? It's mm -hmm. not necessarily that we're sitting so here trying to solve climate change by ourselves, but mm -hmm. you know, if we can convince some more people to recycle, maybe not use, take, you know, reduce one minute out of their showers, it has a, it has a good impact, right? Yeah. Same thing, like if we can create, keep more of that good money in the, the economy, the local community, it'll generate more jobs, more opportunities. Yeah. To teach look for those things. yeah, and obviously we're going to need that as, as the devastation of a lot of communities. We're going to need, need a lot of that coming, coming yeah. out of this pandemic. Yeah, um, yeah no, absolutely. And so how, uh, you just alluded there a moment ago, how you've changed a little bit, you know, your style of, 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 of teaching when you're, you know, you're teaching at UC Irvine. What, are, there other, are there other notable evolutions that when you started first teaching as to now? Uh, yeah, you know, we, we always talk about like the user experience and mm -hmm. 
I've uh, learned that the best way to teach is the student experience. So I don't sit there anymore and say, okay, I'm teaching a class on this subject and I have to cover these 10 things. I think about if the students want to learn something and use it to get a job or in their career, what do they really need to know? And maybe it's really mm -hmm. six things I can teach them very effectively and I have to try and create the experience around it. And so I've actually started structuring my classes as real world work environments. Yeah. And actually using real world projects for them to get the real experiential type of learning. No, and that's fantastic. And I do think that is the future of, um, you know, of, of third level education is it has to get more experiential. And it's even funny, just going back to my son's example, I mean, I'm, I'm just sick of trying to answer that question when he goes, when am I ever going to use this? What's the, why am I learning this? Why am I ever going to use this? And you don't really have a good answer for it. You just say, well, you just do just get on with it and stop annoying me. <laughs> but I think to your point, I think the more we can, uh, align education to um, um, to people's future employment prospects to real world application. I think it's uh, and I think that makes it more accessible for people too, when they can see a direct connection as opposed to one that's very tenuous. Well, I think that's the key thing, right? We always say there's a long term payout. Most people are not good about seeing the long term, right? We're good mm -hmm. at reacting kind of immediate effects, and so yeah. I think the more you can create that tangible line for them, path, the easier they're going to actually uh, understand and you got to show them a little, little immediate value out of it. And that's why I, I always emphasize my students is look, some of the stuff we're learning in this class is going to help you get a job, right? Mm -hmm. Because I teach MBAs, they're, they're going to be looking for a job very soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And and, uh, and as you know, I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of people come out of colleges and come out with with degrees, you know, worked very hard for them, maybe paid a lot of money for them, but they're c completely ill-prepared for the workplace. It's, it's shocking. Uh, you know, I, uh, I sometimes teach a class at the law school, not a lawyer or mm -hmm. never went to the law school, but I'm surprised by how many law students have never been in a courtroom. Wow. Right? And it's like, that, that's like going to be your office. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then, so, I mean, they're going to be a deer in the headlights in their first day of when they're interning or whatever their first junior job at a law firm. And they're like, what? what? And I just think that's, that's the point is we have to make, we have to get these, these um, education and future work so much tighter. Oh, I, that, I think boils down to the practicality and at the end of the day, what's important, right? Is it mm -hmm. trying to hit the checklist of concepts or what's the, tools, knowledge, and skills you're going to need to be successful at something. Yeah. And maybe going back to something you mentioned earlier, maybe this is where VR can start to play a role. I mean, if you think about it, if you could create immersive ex you know, experience to give people a flavor of what it's like to be in a particular job, um, it, may, uh, it may help people with their choices. 100%, right? You get that visceral experience. I actually ironically know that some law schools now are actually uh, establishing virtual courtrooms, right? They're using mm -hmm. VR. This was before COVID, so that at least the students get some exposure, not just like inside the courtroom, but how do you talk to a judge? How do you, mm -hmm. you know, deal with opposing counsel? How do you manage a jury, right? In a relatively safe environment, but at least they get a little bit of hands-on experience. Yeah, and I just think that's 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 priceless because you know sometimes people go into degrees or you know pursue an area because maybe they think they like it. Maybe maybe their parents were saying, "Oh, you make a great lawyer; you should become a lawyer." And then you get into it and you think, "My God, I hate this." Uh, but uh, you know, the more you can, the more you can experience things, and the more practical it'll be in college. I think it'll it'll benefit people. So it benefit both the employer and and the student coming out looking for a job if they're have a little bit better idea of what the reality is like. 100%, right? We, this is all about exploration, especially when you're in, in college and early in your careers to see what you like and you don't like, figure out what you want to do. And if we can at least give people more of those opportunities, um, I think a lot of people will get to what they want to be faster. Absolutely. All right, we're coming up against the end of our time, but before we go, I mean, I got to ask you and um, to explain to people what an IBM master inventor is. Uh, there's only a handful of IBM master inventors, but we're especially guys that have done something so creative, so much around like intellectual capital and property that generated 
billions and millions of dollars. And so I, mm -hmm. I became a master inventor for my work on IBM Watson and helping to pioneer right. AI. Yeah, yeah, and and, um, and obviously uh, IBM Watson has gone from strength to strength and is uh, is playing a significant part in in the evolution of of AI. Well, listen, um, Neil, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Neil's information will be in his contributor bio uh, below this video. But before we go, is there anything else you'd like to tell people about yourself and what you do? Uh, you know, w one of the key things I do is I help people kind of find those hidden dots and put them together. Everyone's looking for that opportunity to excel, innovate, be a disruptor. And everyone tells you just think differently. It's a hard thing to do. And that's actually what I've been doing, helping organizations and people is how do you think differently and how do you unlock value from those opportunities? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I think, uh, and, and if there's one thing that this whole pandemic has taught us is that, that we need to think differently because we were very, maybe a little bit too comfortable in, a comfort, comfortable in the way we're doing things and to be honest, comfortable in a lot of inefficiencies and old ways of doing things that uh, if, as I said, if there's an upside of it, maybe it was a kick in the pants that we all needed to move things forward. Well, as bad as COVID is, I also call it the great accelerator and that it forced mm -hmm. us to deal with some of these inefficiencies, these weaknesses. So it's got us a jump start. Like I said, it's kind of accelerated VR classroom. So there's yeah. some good coming out of it. Yeah, it's exciting. All right, thanks, Neil. Uh, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.